start with, let's start with murmurs. Is that cool? So when we're listening for murmurs specifically, not just regular heart sounds, which part of the stethoscope are we wanting to use? The bell. Right. The bell um, is better for hearing, like you know, the flip side of the, the back side of the stethoscope is better for hearing like the, the lower tones and the, the regular side of the stethoscope is better for hearing like higher tones, like vowel sounds that are more high pitched and murmurs tend to be more low pitched. And so the bell tends to pick up on those better. Um, so if you're specifically looking for murmurs, it's better to use the bell of the stethoscope. Now, if someone does have a murmur, I'm gonna just draw a heart here. Um, where do you tend to hear murmurs the clearest? Apex. And which side? Hmm? Yes, on the left side. You hear them tend to, at the apex and on the left side, if, if they're positioned on their left side. Like patient, have the patient positioned onto their left as you listen to the apex. Does that make sense? If for some reason it just helps you to hear it better. Mm -hmm. um, now if you're listening and you hear, um, let's see how, lub, dub, ta, which murmur is that? said it was S3. Yep, so that's an S3 sound. This is the one that's also called the gallop. That sounds like the horse's hooves going. So la da ta, la da ta, la da ta. And what does this, what does this murmur indicate? If you hear this. Why so is anything, it? anything that's causing uh, difficulties for the ventricle to fill. So it's like something resisting filling. So there might be like a, what would that be a mitral valve? Leap this is the, the, vent, uh, the ventricle here. Um, anything that causes fluid overload. Remember when we talked about in CHF, that, that mm -hmm. uh, S3 murmur is common with CHF because the congestive heart failure has to do with the excess fluid, right? Which is part of where we get the congestive from. So anytime that there's excess fluid in the heart, the murmur that you are gonna tend to hear is the S3, the lub dub ta. So is that like the, would, would the fluid be coming back from the lungs then? Well, no, remember this no, is the fluid of the lungs. The, the lungs are between the, the right side and the left. So if you would hear fluid backing up into the lungs, but the lungs isn't causing this side. This side causes it to the lungs. Right. Remember? So just whenever the, when there's too much fluid in the, in the heart backed up, it tends to make that sound. Okay. Now, on the other end, if you hear it before, you will see here, ta, love, dub. What is this one? She said ventricle resistance from an atrial kick during thesis. I don't know what that means. In my, in my notes, they're explained a little bit different, but it should be like the same information. This one's the S4. Yeah. I call this one the S4. Yeah. And this one, um, from, from my notes, talk about how it's, when the, remember we talked about in, in CHF, when the heart tries to compensate, it starts hypertrophying, getting bigger, the heart muscle gets bigger. So when the heart muscle gets bigger to try and get stronger, which it doesn't actually, to, to kick the blood out to overcome the systemic vascular resistance, um, you'll hear the, the S4 which is symbolic of, okay, the heart is getting hypertrophy, growing bigger, or cardiomegaly is another way to call it. Um, does that make sense? Okay. So they're kind of related, remember, because in CHF, it's the excess fluid that weakens the heart, and then that causes the heart to hypertrophy. So an S3 murmur could lead to an S4 murmur, right? So fluid, fluid overload, can lead to hypertrophy, just like when we talked about in the CHF lecture. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So fluid comes first. We can stretch it out the heart like a big balloon or big rubber band. Heart tries to compensate by building up more muscle, and that's when you hear an S4. Clear as mud. <laughs> you know, do you guys have a test soon? It was supposed to be Friday, but she just moved it to next Wednesday. Oh, nice. Which is, because there's a child called this next day, so Wednesday it is. That's a mixed blessing. Some people really need the test. 
because they're still doing something right now. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, it's good. More time to study. Um, is it okay to erase this? So we're going to move on to the itises, all the different kinds. So I know that this isn't what the heart looks like, but just for the sake of the drawing, this is what it's going to be. Oh, that's really uneven. That's going to bother me. <laughs> so it's never going to It's work. fine. It's you know what it is. What it is. It's all good. Okay. So I'm just going to make a quick little diagram, and it might help visualize more of what the heart looks like for the itises. So this red stuff is going to be the heart muscle. I'm just going to go all the way around. It doesn't have to be super pretty. It's stunning. Okay, so the red we're going to call the myocardium, which is just a fancy way for saying heart muscle because myo means muscle, cardium means heart. Um, the black here is going to be the inner layer. So this is the endocardium. So endo meaning inner and cardium meaning heart. Then you have another layer surrounding the heart muscle. This is the epicardium. There's a lot of cardiums, epicardium. And then we have this, I'm gonna use blue, and I'm gonna go like this to indicate fluid. These are supposed to be waves. <laughs> like I get that. So this is technically the pericardial space where there's fluid inside to create like lubrication. Because if you have something that's constantly moving and to get build up friction, right? And it creates heat. So the fluid helps, you know, keep it lubricated and keep it from getting overheated. Um, what did I just say this was? Pericardial space. <laughs> so you do have some fluid in there to keep it nice and smooth. Um, and then after that is the pericardium. So that's the last thing. And this is a sac that holds the fluid inside. You, you will hear it called the pericardium or the pericardial sac. I'm just gonna put pericardium sac there. Um, so you got your kind of like a Ziploc bag holding in the fluid. And then you've got the, the layers of the heart. So you can have different problems in any one of these layers, which causes the different itises, just inflammation of whichever part we're talking about. So if we're gonna start with endocarditis, which one is the one that's being inflamed? Inside. The endocardium, right? So this is the very inner layer. So this is the layer that like, if you were to like dissect the heart and open it up, it would be like the inner chambers of the heart, including the valves. So I guess I'll put- So the valves are included in any endocarditis? Mm -hmm. okay. I know that this is not what it looks like, but it's fine. Yeah. Pieces are working very much the same, so. It feels you, you, you get it. You yeah. get it. Yeah. <laughs> you get it. So infective endocarditis. It's going to be inflammation of the inner lining. So inside the inner lining of the chambers and the valves, um, what are some reasons or risk factors that puts you at a higher chance of getting endocarditis? Uh, oh, sorry. Infection, bacterial or viral or right? It wasn't there. There's various risk factors. Um, any, I promise you that age is probably going to be a risk factor for everything. Okay. So we're going to put age. Anytime you get older, you have a risk factor for pretty much everything. Um, what about a decreased immune system? Yeah, immunodeficiency. Because it's infective, right? Yeah, is it infected? Okay. okay. Yeah. 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 Um, so weakened immune system, you're more likely to get infective endocarditis. Yeah. Um, having a metal valve, she mentioned. Having a what? Prosthetic valve. Yes, I was about to write that one. So the reason why prosthetic valves 
Or let me ask you, why do you think a prosthetic valve would be an increased risk factor for well, endocarditis? Just because they're often metal. There's a metal involved, and metal attracts clots. But I imagine it also can fail. You know? It's more yeah. likely to fail than a natural. Also, there's, for some reason, like whenever there's a non, like organic, like non, like alive thing in someone's body, like if there tends to be like, bacteria tend to colonize on it. Mm. Not sure why, like people who get like knee replacements, sometimes they can go bad. I actually, like I was in the hospital um, yesterday with um, a clinical group and there's this one lady who's had surgery on her right knee seven times because it keeps getting infected because she's got like implants or rods in it. Um, and like, just for some people, whenever you have like a foreign device in your body, like bacteria tend to congregate there and just cause an infection. So imagine having that inside your heart, it increases the likelihood. Um, and then this is, what's the big one? The, bi the big one that pretty, and it's kind of bad because whenever someone comes into the ER with endocarditis, the first thing people think of to say, yeah, IV drugs. And that's not, you know, that's not always the case because there's, you know, people that don't use IV drugs that get endocarditis, but this is like kind of a big one. Like a lot of is people. Is it the most common, the most common cause of endocarditis? It's, it's well, especially in like certain, like Chad yeah. Yoga, you know, places that uh, are known for like certain drugs and things, you know, you're like, hmm, you're coming to the ER with endocarditis and you can kind of spot people. They kind of like have that look. Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's common. Um. You know, I mean, there are other reasons, obviously, but it tends to be one of the first things people think of. Especially if they're younger. Yeah. Younger yeah, right. If they don't have any of these other risk factors, you're like, well, it's probably IV drugs, right? If they're like a young person, you know, they don't have any of these other, other things going on. Um, okay, so just imagine that this person has endocarditis, their valves, their chambers are inflamed. What kind of signs and symptoms would you expect to see in this type of person? She also, she, she also mentioned dental. Oh, yeah. So, is that just because bacteria can get in the bloodstream? Yeah, I'm not actually sure why that's a risk factor. Um, but whenever have, people have, like, invasive... Um, oh, she did say, yeah. She said, invasive dental work. Yeah. That it, it can happen. Um, so, a lot of the times, like, they'll put people on, like, prophylactic antibiotics after dental work. Not so much, well, yes, also to help with their, you know, their infection in their mouth or prevent um, infection building up there, but to pr protect the heart as well. I can't remember, I'm trying to remember back, I mean, I was in school a long time ago, but they were explaining that, like, it's just really close, like, from the mouth to the, the heart, like, it's a, there's, like, a certain blood supply that, like, flows directly there, so it tends to happen. I'm not really sure about the anatomy of it, but, um, yeah, they do say that, like, if you're having, if you have heart issues and that you've had endocarditis before, that you make sure you take prophylactic antibiotics before any dental work, because if you just have a tendency for it, does that make sense? I'm pretty sure people that have like prosthetic valves and stuff, they have to like take antibiotics before they go do dental work and things like that. Okay. Um, yes. Anyways, yeah, thank you for reminding me of that one. Um, back to signs and symptoms. You know, was, try to imagine what kind of signs and symptoms you would, what would make sense with this diagnosis. Well, hearing the murmur. Uh, yeah. So. Yeah, murmur, obviously, their heart's in distress. It's going to cause murmur. Um, what else? They have an infection, so. Oh, fever. Yeah, typical oh, infection yeah. things. Fever. Um, the other interesting thing that is kind of out there is what else do you see? Like, if when, you, if you, when you get imaging, what, what tends to pop up on imaging when someone has um, endocarditis? Like, what can you see, like? If you get like an echocardiogram or x-ray. Oh, uh, would there be regurgitation of, what, I guess it's on the valves, would there be blood regurgitation? Or there could be, heart there could be, um, especially if there's something wrong with the valve that could cause regurg. What I'm thinking of is, I don't know if she mentioned the vegetative formations. Oh, she did. Yeah, so I've seen a few like pictures on the internet I've seen. and like for whatever reason, like these little, I don't know how to draw all of this, but like these little like cauliflower looking things start growing. And as you can probably imagine, that can cause problems, especially if that were to grow near a valve. Imagine if like this cauliflower-like thing grows right near that valve. Now suddenly you have a problem with blood flow. Oh, that's actually the wrong direction. You have a problem with blood flow <laughs> getting through, right? No, it was the right direction. I wish I was gonna think of the opposite. 
<laughs> Sorry, I'm thinking. changed at all. My yeah, no, you're good. <laughs> I just woke up from a nap. <laughs> Lucky. You got, if you have these things growing in front of a valve, it could block the flow, which can cause the regurg, which, and if you start having problems with the blood flow, now you suddenly have fluid buildup, right? So what can that lead to? That can lead to heart failure, and it's not even related to, you know, you having high blood pressure or fluid overload. It's just related to something's wrong with your valves, and so you go look, oh, look, you have a vegetative formation blocking your valves. So... That's, that's why they always do like imaging to see why you have CHF because it could be from various reasons. Okay. So it's not always because you've had hypertension your whole life and haven't treated it. Usually, but not always. Okay, so how are you going to diagnose this person? So you ex maybe you suspect someone has endocarditis. They come in, you know, they're young. They not, they're not old. You know, they're you know, like, it's, hmm, it's kind of weird that this person has cardiac issues, you know, they have a fever, they're complaining of chest pain and different things, like, how are you going to diagnose it for sure? I, I mean, the echocardiogram. Yeah, so imaging, obviously. Yeah. Um, so, um, that's a D. Diagnosis, you're going to use an echo to take a, uh, take a picture and take a video of what's going on. Um, also, blood cultures. Blood cultures are a big one, because um, they have the infection, right? So, be in their bloodstream. And if they have, you know, pops up on the blood cultures, you're like, ah, okay, yeah, they have an infection in the bloodstream. See that's all an echocardiogram. There you go. What about treatment? How do you treat it? Antibiotics. Yep, obviously, antibiotics. What else? What are we, what are we worried about anytime there's something wrong with the heart? Um, oh, uh, heparin. Yep, so clots are a big thing, right? Yeah. Anytime that it... Anytime there's anything interrupting the blood flow, it can get stagnant, just like a nasty lake, just fluid sitting on top. You want it to be constantly flowing out so it doesn't sit there and pool and start to get clotty. So they're gonna have to be on anticoags or anticoagul anticoagulants um, during this time. So anticoags. And then what else m might they need? Let's say they do have vegetative formation or they do have a, or a valve issue. Um, How are you gonna fix that? Well, I was just, I thought that the antibiotics would fix that. Wouldn't well, that'd fix the fixed. infection, right? But if they have a vegetative thing growing here or they have something wrong that with their- Does that have to be removed? Mm -hmm. wow, so, yeah. so surgery, surgery is another treatment. If they have, if they need a valve replaced, Okay. Obviously, they have to do surgery. Um, if they have an abscess, do you know what an abscess is? That's like a pus filled. Yeah, like a big nasty kind of like a cyst yeah. thing. Um, like a dead spot with pus, they have to take that out. So surgery is sometimes needed, sometimes not, depending on what's going on. So, all right. Any questions about endocarditis? No? Um, would sudden weight gain just because be because of the fluid, fluid possibly, yeah. yeah. I'm gonna go ahead and erase this one. Yeah. You better be taking notes back there, sir. <laughs> He's Are you my last. He's my ride. <laughs> <laughs> I told him he has to come and learn all the nursing things. <laughs> He's a pilot, so he doesn't, I was gonna say, what do you do? He doesn't <laughs> care about this stuff at all. <laughs> You might get someone with endocarditis. Hey, if someone on the plane drops over and you're like, oh, look, they, they have, have a fever and, a, and chest pain, they might have endocarditis. Yeah. Someone's like, hey, what are you going to do? <laughs> I don't know. Keep flying. <laughs> Open heart surgery right now <laughs> on the plane. Come over here so I can inspect your pericardium. <laughs> we haven't gotten there yet. We're talking endocardium. <laughs> okay, now we're going to do pericarditis. 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 So this is inflammation of the outer sac. So just off the top of your head, what kind of problems do you think that can pose? Constriction of the heart. Yeah, so it's the whole, it's holds the whole heart together, right? So yeah. if that thing is constricting and it's like, hmm, okay, problem, right? So what are some risk factors that put you at risk for developing this? Um, would it also be infection, like bacteria? Or yeah, um, this one's more of an inflammation thing. 
um, rather than like necessarily an infection. That's what they call it, infective endocarditis. This one's just, you know, itis means inflammation of. Okay. So like tonsillitis, inflamed tonsils. So this one, anytime that you have like a scenario in your body where you have like chronic inflammation, and a lot of people have this problem. So anything causing chronic inflammation, there are certain, um, what's that one disease? The autoimmune, um, is it lupus? Um, uh, and my man, multiple sclerosis? Whatever it is, whenever you have chronic inflammation in your body, it puts your pericardium at risk for being inflamed too. I mean, also, lupus, yeah, lupus. Yeah, so that's it. I think that's one. Yeah. I think there's more than one. There's lots of kind of autoimmune things that cause like a lot of massive like system, systemic wide inflammation. Another thing would be like radiation and chemo put you at risk just because your whole body is like, what the heck is going on? <laughs> oh, tuberculosis, I mentioned. Chemo, so just cancer in general. Um, there was a, I saw a patient who had, he had had surgery to remove clots. He had some sort of bleeding or blood disorder where he was just throwing out clots all, all over. And, um, they removed all these clots, and then on his way from ICU, he threw another clot, and I heard a, a rub, a cardiac rub, hmm. the that sound, yeah, which was fascinating. Just you know, sad, but yeah, fascinating. Was was it the surgery or was it the clot? Like what would cause? I mean, oh, he probably right. just has a heart condition where he's like, there's a lot of problems with the heart and so you're hearing that and that's probably why he's throwing so many clots i'm not sure what his situation I, is like they didn't know what was causing him to clot so much a little bit out of but either. i was just <laughs> kind of like none of these seem to line up with yeah okay. anytime there's an issue with the heart you, you want to think about clotting so you know just in general um are some other ones uh i'm not really sure exactly what i can speculate but they had renal failure on on the notes do they have that on yours too mm -hmm. The only thing I think of is that the kidneys are what's responsible for cleansing the blood of toxins. Okay. So if the kidneys aren't doing their job and they're not cleansing the body of toxins, then those toxins can obviously, everything in your body gets filtered through the heart also. So it probably just very irritating to the heart. I mean, you got all sorts of toxins in your body um, that could irritate it. So I'm guessing that would be why. Um, yeah, so that's that. All right, so signs and symptoms, signs and symptoms. You got an inflamed sac here. What do you expect to see? Um, uh, muffled heart sounds. Let's see. Chest pain. Yeah, so specifically the pleuritic chest pain too, um, which is like having to do with the lungs. So like we're having to do with when you breathe and swallow and that sort of thing. Uh, like Is that just because of the pressure? Or what is, why? I'm, just, I'm just assuming that like, the heart is being squeezed and that's affecting the lungs too because everything you know you go from this side to the lungs and then back to this side so everything that affects the heart will eventually go to the lungs as well you know back up through the, the pulmonic veins and arteries so it's, and also i guess when you breathe in it's this is also probably why this is probably what it is when you breathe in it brings in more pressure so now it's even more pressure like squeezing the heart again. so then when you exhale it's like okay let we're leaving the pressure more pressure in, squeezing the heart even more. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. That's probably also what it is. Um, probably same thing with coughing. You're coughing. <coughs> That's a strong, like, tensing moment, putting pressure on the heart. Um, yeah, so, like, you can tell if, like, when you breathe in, cough or swallow, and it's more painful. That's pleuritic chest pain. Okay. Um, some other signs and symptoms. Um, generic, I should have added these to the other one as well, along with fever, but... Yeah, like white blood cells. Yeah, white blood cells increase. Inflammatory markers. Yeah. Um, and then this is also what, you're, what you would hear when you mentioned the friction rub. Um, the, when you're listening to the heart sounds. Mm -hmm. Have you ever, have you ever um, heard like the sound of like, how do I explain this? You know, like when, have you ever ridden a horse? So you like know the sound like the saddle makes when it's kind of like creaking and oh, yeah. like that. Uh, Ah, uh, I can't do it. But you know what I'm talking. <laughs> the sound that the leather makes when it's kind of stretching, like that's kind of what the the friction rub sound like. And it's like, 
again, the, this, this is being inflamed, which is what's holding the water. And so it's like, this is supposed to help with friction, but if the sac is inflamed, then it's like, it's gonna be causing friction instead of helping with friction. So you're gonna hear friction rub. Does that make sense? So like if this is getting bigger and inflamed, it's probably gonna be rubbing against this. So the pericardium, sorry, the epicardium might be touching this now because it's so inflamed, you know? So you would hear the rub of these two rubbing against each other. Um, let's see, what else? Friction rub. When, were you, when do you hear the friction rub is another good question. They might ask you that in the test. Well, when there's fluid buildup in the- Sorry, I should say, not like when, as you're listening to the patient, um, when can you hear it best? Between breaths, I mean. Oh, okay. So at the end of their expiration, after they breathe oh. out, um, you'll hear it. And I assume that's because like you're you're like, you're putting out all of your air, and then that's when you can finally hear the rub, because um, there might be other like the breathing in, breathing out at the end of their breath. So like, <sighs> then you'll hear the ah, that rubbing sound. It's very uncomfortable to listen to. It just sounds like grinding. It's, yeah, I got to hear it. It's and like I actually the like patient it. was. Um, he didn't quite code, but it was a rapid, and so there was no asking him to hold his breath, so I didn't get that opportunity of like, could you hold your breath so I can? It was, I wasn't sure if it was poor. So, end of expiration, okay. and on my notes it said the left lower sternal border is where you'll hear it best. I'm sure you can hear it other places as well, but, you know, you have like your chest, you know, your sternum right here on the left lower. No, oh, she said that. It is in there. Okay. I mean, this diagnosis question is kind of going to be the, very similar, but how do you diagnose this? Oh, well, I guess you'd have to do a scan, but let's, you know, if you heard that sound, but she also, she also mentioned Beck's triad. Oh, I don't, what is that one? Muffled heart sounds. Okay. Decreased or blood pressure decrease, but also the systolic and diastolic are closer, yeah. grow closer together, and then jugular vein distension. Okay, yeah. I didn't know that was called a triad, triad, yeah. Um, you also can look at EKGs. Okay. Um, what would you see on an EKG? Um, she said ST elevation in all leads is... Yeah, so when the heart's in distress, you know, you're gonna see like the ST elevation, and that, I'm gonna put S T L E. Do you know what that looks like? Yeah, so okay. you have your QRS and instead of it going down and then back up into a T wave, it oh, just okay. kind of curves over to the T wave. Let me raise that. It doesn't quite go down, it curves up into the T. Yeah, something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. That's what I picture. In my Beautiful. <laughs> Beautiful. Um, situation. Yeah. The other thing is that this can lead to another problem. Um, what other problem? I mean, if this isn't a big enough problem already, what can pericarditis lead to? That's another problem. I imagine, you know, ch uh, heart failure and maybe like an MI because... I think Professor Hughes said she's had this. Um, I can't... I guess they removed part of her pericardium and then they ended up using it to um, repair the hole in her heart. That's Cardiac tamponade? Did mm -hmm. she say she's had that? Or was that I think she, she mentioned that, yeah, they had to release. I think, I can't remember what she said that she had, but this can lead to cardiac tamponade, and that's when, like, the fluid starts accumulating. And in my mind, I don't always know if this is the right answer, but it makes sense to me that this would happen. Like, if, if you have the, the friction rub, right, because this is getting inflamed, which would mean that these two things are growing closer together because whenever something gets swollen they get bigger right so these two things might start rubbing against each other making that sound my my mind is like okay well you got the fluid in here to prevent that right to keep it to keep the friction from being there to keep it lubricated so they're probably going to start producing more fluid to help out with that friction right and so then cardiac tamponade is when a bunch of fluid starts accumulating in here to the point where like the fluid adds all this pressure on top of the heart and it's like like squishing and squashing the heart with all this extra fluid. So 
I can't really, I don't know how to draw that, but like. Is that non, not inflammatory? Hmm? Is that not necessarily inflammation? Is what inflammation? Cardiac tamponade, is that not caused by inflammation? Well, I'm saying that pericarditis can lead to cardiac tamponade. Oh. Yeah, so that's what I was saying, like, if these two things are rubbing together, they're probably gonna start producing more fluid to lubricate it, to get rid of the friction problem. But then now you have all this extra fluid kind of on top of the heart, adding more weight and pressure that's like squishing it. Okay. Does that make sense? And then how do you get rid of the fluid when you have cardiac tamponade? Cardio or pericardiocentesis. Yeah, okay. And that's when they literally have to inject a needle through the layer of your heart and aspirate that fluid out. She also mentioned, like I said, she called it a pericardial window, said they actually cut a piece of the pericardium out. Is that what she had? Yeah. Okay, yeah. And I had... they used that piece to repair the hole in her heart. Like they used the actual piece of the pericardium. Wow. So then she didn't have about, you know, anything. That's a whole other boring. case study. That's yeah, cool. Yeah, so they literally will inject <laughs> she a needle. She should do a case study on herself. In here and suck out that fluid so they can take out all that pressure on the heart. Because, you know, like it's hard to be when you've got like tons of fluid like just surrounding you. So I don't imagine that would be a fun procedure to have. I imagine she's, it was better for her chest open, so they did it. I don't know. <laughs> I, yeah, oh, I, don't, I don't actually know. <laughs> um, Pericardiocentesis, yeah. All right, so how do we treat this? What do we do? NSAIDs? Mm -hmm. Like, and what are NSAIDs? Anti-inflammatories. Right, so treat it with non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, because what's the problem? Inflammation, right? Right. What else can you give them? Steroids. That's really yeah. Non-steroidal and steroidal. Yeah, non-steroidal <laughs> and steroidal. <laughs> um, and then also antibiotics too, um, just, you know, in general. Um, just in case there's any bacterial. If it's bacterial. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't think NSAIDs are a treatment on any of the other ones. I think that one's probably the differentiation. Usual. Yeah. Um, well, for rheumatic heart disease, it says anti-inflammatory drugs. Okay. Well, never mind. I don't know if it's specifically NSAIDs. All right. We good on this one? She's the positioning hemodialysis if kidney failure is the cause. Mm -hmm. yep. Right. Again, you have to know what's causing it to be able to fix it. Pericardiectomy. Is yeah. If you have renal failure. Part of it. Well, if, if you have renal failure and that's giving you per, you know pericarditis, probably dialysis. dialysis will be a better treatment, right? So it kind of just depends on what's causing it. So. Wait. You're ready for me to race this? Mm-hmm. I'll do some quizzing of you at the end, if, oh. if that's amenable to you. <laughs> How do you feel about that? It's fine. It'll help. Look at you getting this one-on-one -on -one tutor session. Nice. Just keep thinking everyone's gonna listen. My phone I'll leave that on. there. Please. I'll just leave that there. Yes. All right. The next one is myocarditis. Okay, we're out. Of, we're in a different order in our notes, but that's fine. Oh, I'm sorry. That's fine. I just like to do the itises and then do the rheumatic one just because it doesn't have an itis and it bothers me. <laughs> As much as your crooked heart. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> I tried fixing it, and this is not gonna. Um, myocarditis. Okay, so what is this an inflammation of? Myocardium. All right, so the actual muscle itself, right? Um, so I guess in some ways, like, I wonder how they different. I don't have an answer for this, but I'm just thinking, if someone were to take oh, yeah. a, an X-ray, how can they tell if it's myocarditis versus like hypertrophy? But I guess the hypertrophy is probably localized to this ventricle. Um, that would make sense. And then myocarditis is probably the whole thing, you know? I'm just brainstorming out, out loud. Cause I'm just thinking, huh, both of them get bigger. Oh, you, you might see the tell. bulging going out, but not see the pericardial sac filling with yeah. fluid. Yeah, because well, like hypertrophy, kind of... remember how like last time in the previous lecture, I was talking about like how the, like the myocardium of the ventricle starts to get 
smaller and it decreases the amount of space for blood in the middle and it's mostly localized to this one spot versus the myocardia my, my, myocarditis is probably the whole heart so that's probably how we tell the difference that would be a question i would ask i don't want to put anywhere false ideas into your head so okay but that's just something i just thought of just now um i hope this is recording sound I think it is. Great. <laughs> That'd be sad. You think of it now. <laughs> I'm like, oh, well, I, I just feel like it should be. Okay. Um, all right. What, what's, what are some risk factors for this one? Uh, would it also be infection, vi viral? Yeah, okay, this one's specifically some, viral. I was going to say there's, there's, yeah, we've learned that with COVID. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And myocarditis in the vaccine yeah this one's specifically yep specifically viral whereas the other one is is the other ones are usually bacteria mm -hmm. you know like usually usually infections are like when we treat them with antibiotics you know they're because it's bacteria um, but this one's specifically viral um, you can also have this again you said about the vaccine viral and drug reactions so both of those things are relevant to you know, things happening today. Um, so you can have a drug reaction, you know, to a specific drug or even a vaccine, um, viral things causing myocarditis, those are both risk factors. Um, so if your whole heart muscle is coming inflamed, what kind of side of, signs and symptoms, side effects are you gonna expect to see? Well, I imagine it wouldn't work as well. So you'd see signs of heart failure. Could it be both? Well, chest pain for one. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm thinking, yeah, okay. So chest pain is probably going to be like indicative okay. of all of them. Crackles in um, the lungs. Arrhythmias for sure. Arrhythmias, okay. Um, because the muscles are what, you know, cause the heartbeat, right? It's the love dub, it's the squeezing. Okay. So if the muscles themselves are, you know, impaired because of inflammation, um, you're probably going to have some arrhythmias. So when we have arrhythmias, what are we thinking about? What can arrhythmias cause? If it's not oh, clots, clots. So that's bad. Um, clots, which can lead to strokes. Um, or MI, because the yeah. clot could go. It depends. Yeah, it depends where the clot goes. If it goes to the brain, stroke. If it goes to the heart, you know, heart attack. Um, what else? Shortness of breath, obviously, because whenever we have arrhythmias, we don't get great perfusion. We don't have great oxygenation. So if you're feeling short of breath because you're not getting the oxygen to your extremities that you need um, because of reduced cardiac output, right? Okay. Arrhythmia is always, the two things you always want to think of with arrhythmias are clots and cardiac output, okay. right? Because if it's not pumping adequately, those are the two things that are going to be affected. You're not getting the blood flowing good, so you can build up clots. You're not getting the blood flowing well, so you're probably not gonna have great cardiac output, not great perfusion, not great oxygenation. Um, what else? Um, she mentioned fluid buildup with swelling mm -hmm. of the legs and feet. Yep. Is that just because there's inflammation in the leaky vessels or what? Well, the reduced cardiac output, it, you know, it's, a ba it's backing up, right? So if it can't get out, it backs up here. If it can't get out, it keeps just backing up all the way down systemically. Um, so, and then gravity just pulls the fluid down. So if it's, if you've got fluid in your body, it's just going to naturally pull in your feet and ankle because that's just where gravity is going to go. If we've walked on our hands our whole life, they probably would have swelling in their hands and wrists, you know, so it's just the gravity. Um, what else? General feeling of, you know, if it's viral induced, general feeling of malaise, sickness, headache, fever. Uh, the typical, typical virally feeling. Um, so treatments, there wasn't a lot on your notes for treatments, was there? Yeah, it usually goes away without permanent effects. You can't really, here's the thing, like, we can't really treat effects. viruses, you know, like, we don't have antibiotics for viruses, right? So typically when someone has, like, a cold or a flu or something, that, something else that's viral, you just treat the symptoms. So it's just symptomatic care. There's not really like a cure to fix it. Um, and your body usually fights off viruses on its own eventually, um, hopefully. <laughs> um, and so preventative care, 
I think is the one thing that they were stressing um, in your notes is to just, yeah, you know, make sure that you're, you know, just anything that you would do to prevent getting sick, um, general hand hygiene, hand hygiene. Um, what else do they have on your notes for that? Um, sh yeah, hand hygiene, avoid being around infectious people and vaccines, talk to primary about risks versus benefits. But then, but she did also mention um, that it can cause heart failure and she's, and I wrote in before it gets worse, give beta blocker, you know, a, a anti hypertension. Well, yeah, of course this can cause heart failure and it can so also just cause like strokes and heart attacks, you know. Treat, treat the possible effects. Yeah. So, treat the possible yeah, complications. Treat things from getting worse, right? right? So if they are having like heart failure like symptoms, then you would treat it like heart failure like you would when well, we talked about last lecture about CHF and things like that. Okay. So beta blockers, um, you know, because with heart failure, the heart is wore out, right? It's, it's working too hard and it's not having enough, it's not getting enough um, results. And so you want to give the heart a break. Diuretics and... and Right, so diuretics, get some of that yeah, fluid off, antihypertensives, yes. So you can, it's, again, it's not really treating the cause, you know, you can't really treat a virus, but you treat the symptoms of it. So that's really just symptomatic care. Um, so either your, either your body will get over it on its own or you'll have to be hospitalized to deal with preventing clots and all the other heart failure things. <laughs> so you either get better or you won't, one of the two. <laughs> It's either or. <laughs> yeah, so there's not as much. Better, you won't. <laughs> yes, yeah, it's, it's not. There's not as much on this one compared to the other ones. Nurse, am I gonna be okay? You'll either get better or you won't. Right. <laughs> <Thanks>. <laughs> that is true, right? <laughs> um. Okay. Now we can do the rheumatic. Oh, yeah. What do they call it? Rheumatic fever? Is that what it is? Yeah. Rheuma uh, rheumatic heart disease is what they call it. Is there a rheumatic fever too? Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's why I always want to call it that. I always thought that strep throat could lead to rheumatic fever eventually. Like strep throat and then it becomes scarlet fever and then it becomes yeah. rheumatic fever. But Something like that. She differentiated them. So yeah. I'll have to look And then there's up. rheumatoid arthritis. Yeah. So. I had a, one of my boys had he had had strep throat it was right around christmas time so we were like it got better and so we we're like oh okay he's fine and then he got this rash and we we're like well it's you know it's mm. christmas day or whatever and so we we're like well let's let's uh take him on monday but then he got better and then he like couldn't walk his ankles and his wrists and he's like 18 months old wow so he, we ended up taking him and like well he has strep throat but it doesn't need to be treated at this point so Oh, we like had his heart checked and everything. He's fine, but it was That's very good. concerning. Yeah, I remember they wanted to listen to his heart and check his heart and for sure make sure everything was okay. And yeah. the pediatrician said he was fine. Because how this can affect the heart is what it does is like it can per permanently damage valves. So these these little guys, the what do they call it? Rheumatic what? Sorry, heart disease. Thank you, heart disease. Thank you. So. The valves can get permanently messed up, which anytime there's valve issues, there's a problem with flow, right? This is gonna be impaired. This is gonna be impaired. So then we have all the same issues with fluid shifting, right? The fluid can't, but if the fluid can't get out, it's gonna back up, right? So all of these things can lead to heart failure with the congestion and the fluid overload, right? So valves that don't work, very bad. You need them to work. So you might have to do surgery if it gets to the point where the blood, they're just so blocked off from, from being inflamed um, that you have to get prosthetics. So maybe, you know, back to endo, endocarditis, maybe someone was a kid and got the scarlet fever and all of those things, got the messed up heart valves, now they have prosthetic ones, and then those got infected and then they got endocarditis. Could be. You see the chain of events here? Yeah, <laughs> okay, so risk factors. Um, strep infection, like we, like we mentioned, strep. So that could be strep throat, or like you said, scarlet fever. That's a very big T there. Um, scarlet fever, 
those are risk factors. All right, signs and symptoms. Valves aren't working. So we'll just put fever on here, obviously. What else? Um, well, she mentioned the painful joints. Mm -hmm. Just that's what made me think of the rheumatic or rheumatoid arthritis. Yeah. So pain in joints. Nodules, where are those lymph? Yeah, they're just like little bumps under the skin. I'm assuming, yeah, you said lymph, I'm assuming so. Um, it also is the rash, and that what's, that's what ties me into like the scarlet fever thing. Yeah. Um, shortness of breath, pretty much shortness of breath is gonna be a sign and symptom of all of them. <laughs> um, same thing with chest pain, that's gonna be pretty much a sign and symptom for all of them. Um, like the things that are different, I will start. Yeah, uh, this one is very different. I mean, you don't have nodules, rash, and pain in joints for any of the other ones. Yeah, it's good to it's good to be able to highlight the ones that are different because there's a lot that are going to be similar. All right, it's like patient comes in with shortness of breath and chest pain. It's like, well, thanks. That could literally be five different things. So, how do we treat this? Antibiotics. Well, prevent it by yeah. treating. First of all, yeah, the... if you have strep, don't just live your life without treating that yeah right get it fixed um steroids put antibiotics steroids and steroids are just potent um like they they reduce inflammation so it's the inflammation that's causing the swelling and the the scarring and the, the just the messing up of the valves she did mention anti-inflammatory drugs yeah she that's name that, and NSAIDs. yeah I'm, I'm assuming that's probably NSAIDs and steroids um just like, just like it was for pericarditis. And then the surgery, you were talking about possible valve. Yeah, they might have to get their valves removed if they don't respond or they're just so far gone or like they literally are blocked and the blood is not moving. You have to have surgery kind of right now. You can't just wait, you know, 48 hours for the drugs to kick in because you might have to have your heart beat once or twice between now and then. So you might have to have emergency surgery, who knows? Okay. Um, how do you feel about the itises? I'm alright. Think you're alright? We'll see. <laughs> do you ever use Khan Academy? I have. Um, my son uses it a lot. My kids, my kids like it. Yeah, I love it. It's they have lots of good stuff on there. It's nice because I don't remember how to do long division, and they do. So. <laughs> Mommy, how do I do long, long division? I haven't used long division I since know. I was in middle school. <laughs> Me neither. And I feel bad with him learning it because I'm like, <laughs> well, did you have to do your taxes? Yeah, that's the one thing. Like, I'm not going to be able to help my future children with math and be like, sorry, like, I can't help you. <laughs> <laughs> I can't really, teach you something more practical. <laughs> I can teach you nursing, but yeah. I cannot teach you math. Well, that's just not yeah. happening. All right, moving on. Uh, I don't know what's next in yours, but I'm going to do thoracic aortic aneurysm. That's it? Okay. I'm just gonna put TAA, that's fine. I don't feel like writing all of that. Okay, so what even is an aneurysm? A bulging of a vessel, of a, yes. an aorta. <laughs> Specifically, a, yeah. A, so if this, no, is this is your, the aorta, but. Uh, if this is your blood vessel, it's just whenever the, for whatever reason, the lining of the vessels get weak, and so they start pooching out. Yeah. Um, is that a word, pooching? Pooching? Pouching? Uh, pouching, whatever it is. Um, so. These are supposed to be like firm, you know, and strong so that it can withstand the flow of blood going through and the pressure that's exerting out, right? But sometimes the lining gets weak and then if it's weak, there's still pressure pushing out and it's gonna cause it to balloon out, balloon out, balloon out till it bursts, right? And we don't want it to burst because that's bad. So when that happens, okay, so TAA, there's two types. There's, you can have either a dissection or a rupture, right? dissection and rupture. So this is a rupture, right? It explodes like a pimple. And so obviously that's bad because now all the blood that was supposed to be inside of your aorta is now going out of your aorta and spewing all out throughout your body. You have internal bleeding and that's not good. So that's a rupture. Dissection is a step down from a rupture. It's just when it's ruptured within the vessel, but not outside of the vessel. So 
you know how like you have layers to your heart your your vessels also have layers and i don't remember the names of them right now but there's oh gosh i know there's like a muscular layer i think and then there's like the cellular layer whatever it is there's multiple layers within your vessels and let's say this let's say this one ruptures right so all the blood is supposed to be in the middle right but now it can like get in between the layers if that makes sense does that make sense mm -hmm. so that's the dissection um yeah so the bleeding is confined within the layers so it's not bleeding out but it's still not great because it's still not going where it's supposed to be going but a, a, a rupture is way worse because you could just bleed out entirely now let's see what kind of risk factors are there that um, contribute to someone developing this? Oh, that's okay. That's thinking. High blood pressure. Yeah, exactly. So this one, obviously, yeah, high hypertension, right? The more pressure you have inside of the of, of your vessels, obviously, it's going to get to the point where it's going to rupture, right? So that just just common sense. Hypertension for sure. Um, what else? High cholesterol, can you explain that? Yeah, so high cholesterol, you know, it leads to the, typically leads to like buildup of plaque inside the arteries. Right. Um, so. And arterial, yeah, she had atherosclerosis. It yeah. isn't, uh, atherosclerosis is the plaque buildup. Mm -hmm. Cholesterol usually leads to that. So okay. you have like so this kind of like plaque buildup here. No, these risk factors aren't always like different, but like contributing. Yeah. So like if you have high cholesterol, you're probably going to have atherosclerosis. And if you have atherosclerosis, you're probably going to have hypertension. Why? Because if you have a plaque buildup, you've just done what? You've narrowed, okay. you've just narrowed the opening, right? And then we talked last time about whenever you narrow an opening, it builds up the pressure, just like a hose. If you just let the hose run, it comes out, you know, not very fast put your thumb over a part of it and you leave a small opening, the, the water starts spurting, right? So there's more pressure. So they just narrowed the opening here. So that's how you have cholesterol that leads to atherosclerosis, which leads to hypertension. So would the, would just the high pressure with the um, rupture or dissection occur at the top of the vessel in your picture? Is that? Um, probably, I mean, I don't, it would have to, I mean, it would, it would make from sense. the cholesterol breaking off and causing damage when it breaks off. That's also, I'm trying to remember. Um, it doesn't matter. I don't need to know, but. I watched a video about this. Okay. Um, this, the, you know, having this here is also just highly irritating to the vessel lining too, which can weaken it. And um, you get like micro cuts in the lining, you know? Okay. And then like that can lead to like clot buildup that can lead to like just a weakening in general. And so rupture dissection um, related to that and just the hypertension in general. Okay. And Mark Van syndrome was a concave chest and that they just tend to have cardiac issues. Oh, I was going to look that up. I That's forgot to look that up. Tall. That's what? That's why they're super tall. Like, oh my gosh. <laughs> do you have Marfan syndrome? Go like the, no. Wait, what is that? Uh, I guess if their thumb like extends beyond their Usually they they'll go out like that. Oh my gosh, my like, thumb goes beyond. I know mine goes really close, but, <laughs> but they're tall. They're like seven feet tall. He's six foot seven. Yeah. I heard somebody say that once before. But what? They usually have a concave chest and have heart issues. Do you have a concave chest? Yeah, my heart is <laughs> I think to be a pilot, they like stuff they do. Yeah, they probably have to check that. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I was thinking about someone's markings too. That's really funny. I'm glad you don't have that. Yeah, I don't know much about. I had written a note to myself to look that up, and I didn't, so I know nothing about Marfan syndrome. <laughs> so sorry, um, but apparently the thumb trick is all I know now. I watched a bunch of videos. My kids and I were interested. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like Martian, Marfan, Martian syndrome, Martian syndrome, and alien. It's really tall. Yeah. All right, signs and symptoms. They're alien guessing obviously your your thing just ruptured what are you going to feel pain yeah obviously um where are you going to feel it 
in the chest or yeah. anywhere wherever the rupture is. Yeah, they say that. Be. Yeah, the aorta is kind of big, <laughs> so it's yeah, like. I was gonna say, can it yeah. be in the abdomen? They say that it tends to be either like near the heart or in the back. Oh. Okay. Um, back pain. So, they also say that people have a hoarse voice, and I have zero idea how that's related. Laryngi- laryngeal nerve is affected. Sure, the lyngeal, laryngeal nerve Can is affected. Right? Yeah, I did not know that. She I said was, that's different from other conditions. That's a differentiating yeah, that, symptom. Yeah, that hoarseness is definitely not related to any of the other yeah. ones. And then cough and shortness of breath. Shortness of breath again is everyone. So let's see. How can we remember hoarseness? Well, she put a picture of a horse. Yeah, about how you're going to relate that to an aneurysm. I just started. Him. <laughs> um. This might be dumb, but this might look like a horse's nose. You know, it balloons out like this, and you have like the little horse's nose right there. <laughs> and this could be an ear, and that could be an ear. That's fine. There you go. There's your horse. <laughs> I don't know. It looks like a horse's nose to me. <laughs> Sometimes you just got to have weird things to remember. Um, okay. Treatment. How do you treat this? Probably surgery. Yeah, know. that's really it. Just cut them up and yeah, you gotta just get in you there. just gotta fix that bad yeah. boy. I mean, you can't really give them a medicine. And be like, here you go. Do like, they do like a, like cut out that part and replace it? I'm or? sure. I'm sure they do. I'm sure they. Do. I'm sure they cut this part out and then just reattach it. Or maybe they, if it hasn't ruptured yet, maybe it's like just ballooning out. Maybe they like reinforce it and wrap it with something. Sternotomy. Oh, they're just saying open. Chest. Yeah, sternotomy. Okay. Open the chest up that way. It's gonna be open heart for sure. Um, yeah, I'm not an expert in how they fix these, but that's just... It doesn't matter. <laughs> Surgery. I tend to want to know more than I need to know. Oh, yeah, to me just too. just shut, shut it off. It helps me have, like, a bigger picture of what's happening. Yeah. Um, you ready to erase this? Mm-hmm. Okay. She just mentioned surgical complications. Well, obviously. There's going to be yeah. tons. I think that most of them are related to clots. Yeah. Um, blood supply to vital organs. But that's, you know, that's common sense. Bleeding. I mean, yeah. All right, I'm paralysis. Gonna, paralysis. I'm going to erase this whole thing because we're moving on from this. Actually, do I want to erase this? <sighs> Acute coronary syndrome. Yeah, I will. So we're going to talk about angina and MRI. Yep. Mm, sad. Goodbye. <laughs> So hard. I know it was a really pretty drawing. <laughs> Put in effort. Where are your uh, two friends today? Um, they were here last time. I don't know. They're younger students. I don't. Oh, okay. I'm I just like so. <laughs> I just assume. Oh, you're in the same friends. class. Your friends. We all know each other. Yeah. All right. ACS, acute coronary syndrome. Oh, A, C, S. Okay, so this encompasses angina, or I've heard people say angina. I don't know. I think angina sounds better, but I've, I've definitely heard people say angina. Um, so, a couple types of angina. We got stable, unstable, and variant, which they also call prince metals, which I don't know why they call it that. She does, that's we don't. Huh? What did you call it? Un... Uh, oh, variant. Okay. Stable, unstable, and variant slash Prince Metals. You don't have that? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we do. I was about to say, I'm not Microvascular. Microvascular is another one. Let's see. Stable, unstable, microvascular, and variant. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> microvascular. Yes, I, I discovered pretty quickly that this table moves. Okay, yeah. These are, these, are, these are the main main three. Um, okay, so stable. They're stable, obviously. So this one, I like to say is basically if you have stable angina, you're basically just out of shape, right? Like, that's essentially... I experience angina walking up all those Ellen White stairs. Um, <laughs> I was just like shortness of breath, and you're like... <gasps> Gosh, I don't want to reveal to people how out of shape I am, right? <laughs> yeah, it's literally, I mean, obviously it's more than just being out of shape, but essentially that's what it is. It's pain with exertion, relief with rest, right? I don't really have chest pain with exertion, I just have shortness of breath with exertion. 
So chest pain um, with exertion relieved by rest and what? Nitro. So rest and nitroglycerin. What does the nitro do? It the dilate. Yep, so it just widens those vessels to allow more blood to flow through and allows the heart to calm down. Unstable, same thing. Um, rest, okay. except you're just even more out of shape. Yeah. So you have pain with, even at rest. So pain at rest now. So these people are obviously unstable because it's like, okay, well, if you just have this one then you can just, you know, rest and it'll fix it. But if you have unstable, it's like, okay, you're getting to the point where you need some kind of serious interventions here. Um, so what kind of, what kind of things would you expect to see on like an EKG if they have unstable? She said, um, ST depression and or T wave inversion, Yes. but no ST elevation. Right. Cause what is ST elevation? That would be damage, right? Yeah, no, that's, right? you'd see this that with heart damage. attack. This could be damage. Okay, MI, yeah. Yeah, so with an MI, you'll see ST elevation. I'll put that here. She did say there could be, oh, no changes in, in troponin or anything. So there's no damage at this point? Is that yeah, so this, this one's, they're just like, their heart is like really unstable right now, but they haven't gotten to the point where they're like having active damage, right? Because okay. once you've damaged the heart, it's not like reversible. Like you can't like undead heart muscle, right? It's just dead. So but none you, of it is dead at this point. It's just damaged. Yeah. So it's just it's just like stressed right now. Or stress, not even damaged, but just okay. right. So MI would be damage. Unstable is just like okay, you're about to become damaged if you don't fix it. So this one might not even respond to nitro. You might have to take more than one. Um, I saw this one practice question. It was like okay, they're they're feeling chest pain, they've rested and it's not working, and so they had to take multiple nitro and that leads you to think that it's unstable versus stable. So, like you said, ST depression, so what would that look like? Um, instead of the QRS kind of going to the baseline, it would go down in the back. Yeah, I don't know how to draw that. I don't either. Is that something like that? It's depressed, because this is, this is the baseline, so it's under, um, something like that, right? And then what was the other one? T wave inversion. Yeah. Just instead of having the Yes. So T wave um, you'll have more of a unit. So it's just yeah. Yeah. T wave inversion. Um what does the T wave inversion mean? Like when you see that, like okay, what does that mean? Ischemia, she said. Yeah. Yep, so ischemia, what is ischemia? Uh, Ischemia I don't know. <laughs> is reduced oxygen flow. Okay, but not quite. So it leads to necrosis. Yeah, so once it's gotten to the point where so much oxygen depletion that it dies, that's when you get necrosis, right? So ischemia leads to necrosis, and then what would a necrosis look like on an EKG? Death. Death. <laughs> <laughs> Hold on, she's she's ischemia necrosis. Wouldn't that be the in the process, muscle injury. Uh, it looks like an uh, ST elevation. Oxidant. No, necrosis. Q wave. Q wave with. For death. ST elevation, I have muscle injury, and then Q wave formation is necrosis. Yes. So this is like where it's just straight up dead. Doesn't oh, work. It's like a dead spot. Necrosis is a dead spot. It's like a scar that doesn't like respond or do anything. You know, it's just, it's just there. Yeah, it doesn't beat. Yeah. So that would look like the Q wave formation, which is where your Q just get fat, essentially. So you have your P and then your Q awkward like that, and then your ST. So this is the Q here. And it's just really fat for some reason. Um, and that doesn't go away, right? So Q wave, they will always have a Q wave forever and always. So like you could have someone come into the hospital and they're perfectly fine and you see Q wave, like don't freak out. That doesn't mean that they're actively having a heart attack. It means that they've had one before. Okay, she said inverted Q and elevated ST means necrosis and non-reversible. That's not reversible. Do you wanna see the picture that's in mine? I don't know if you sure. have the same you can, picture. You can also see, I can show you mine too. I don't know if it's the same one. It looks like it might be. Oh. There's, I have it your way. Um, There's the inverted Q and then the ST elevation. And I wrote 
down here, inverted, I don't know if I'm, yeah, I pointed to it, inverted Q. Well, if and they're having I'll elevated ST, that means they're having active muscle injury, right? But like, they don't necessarily have necrosis yet. Okay, and that's what I said is the ST alone is the muscle injury and it's still reversible, but that inverted Q with the elevated ST yeah, is the Q, like- The Q wave right. formation is necrosis and they do not go away. Just the way you were saying? Okay, yeah. okay. So, so it's just this fat thing here. It's a, yeah, because usually it's skinny. You know, it's like this. So yeah. it's wider and deeper. Yeah. So it goes lower and it's fatter. And that, like, that's going to always be on a patient's EKG for the rest of their life, right? Because the, once it's dead, it's dead. The ST elevation is showing, like, hey, we're in distress right now. Like, this is an active heart attack currently happening, right? And the ST elevation, which I drew before, which is like jumped ahead P, Q, R, S like that. This is yeah. like the baseline, it's just up there. So this is ST elevation. Yeah. So this is MI, right? Like currently happening. This one is like, they've had an MI before. And so if you see that, don't freak out because that's just gonna be there forever. Does that make that's sense? Okay. Yeah. Where were we though? I, I don't know where like we were. I just, I threw you off. Oh, sorry. we were on uns unstable angina. Yes, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's fine. Um, Unstable, yeah. So you would, okay, so which EK, don't look at your notes. Which EKGs are you gonna see with unstable angina? That was the inverted. Un inverted what? Um, T. T. So inverted T, you will have for unstable. You have the answer on the board. Huh? I'm just kidding, I thought of it, I really did. What so else? You have, the, you have the answer on the board. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> what else? One, one more. <clears throat> ST what? Was there ST elevation? Not elevation, because yeah. that's MI, but you'll have ST depression. So the opposite, ST depression, ST depression. By ST depression, do you just mean it goes below baseline? Yeah. Okay. So you won't see ST elevation until it's an active MI. And you also won't have those biomarkers like troponins and all that stuff, um, unless it's an MI. Does that make sense? kind of a mess, sorry. I'm just trying to come up with my own picture here. It's okay. <laughs> I tend to draw. Um, okay. So if you see troponins, what will that tell you? That there's been damage. They're, yeah, they're in an MI right now, right? Okay. Yeah, troponins or MI, ST elevation is MI. Um, Q wave is they've been had an MI, right? Okay. Um, been had, that is not proper grammar. <laughs> I'm like, okay, sorry. Whatever you say. He's over there judging me. <laughs> He's not even listening. That's fine. I said that they, you've been had. You've been had an MI. Done been He's had. judging you in his career. You've done been had an MI. <laughs> you are now in the South. Um, yeah, that is Welcome. very good. All right. So treatments. Um, nitro, you might have to take more than one to fix it because it's unstable. Um, antiplatelets, like Plavix, for example, because um, again, heart's in distress, what are we worried about? Clots and things. How do we diagnose this? How do we know if someone has unstable angina, other than like they're presenting symptoms? What kind of, what can you get them to do to test the functionality of their heart? Stress test? Mm -hmm. Yep, stress oh, test. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. So stress test will tell you, like, hey, okay, like, how much exercise can you do and tolerate, right, before you're, like, done? Um, you know, it's like the treadmill thing. They measure your blood pressure and your heart rate and all that. They'll tell you what kind of shape you're in. Or the, uh, was it dobutamine? What is it? Which one is it? For what? The one that stresses the heart. <laughs> <laughs> um, Whatever. I don't remember. That was a semester ago. Yeah, like that's been a minute for me. All right, and then variant. Sorry, let me not erase. Variant is like weird because it's not related to really these. It has. It's like it comes and goes, and it's related to vasospasms. So, like your vessels just like spasming, and it's like. And a lot of the times, it has to do with like other reasons besides this. So it has to do with like being really cold your vasospasms will occur or being stressed. Um, you'll also see this with smokers. They'll have 
vasospasms. It's just something that's irritating the vessels, so they're spasming. Um, certain meds will do it. Cocaine, for sure, will cause a lot of problems. Yeah, I mean, think about it. Like, nicotine is vasoconstrictive. Um, a lot of stress will cause vasoconstriction. The cold will call, cause vasoconstriction because you're breathing. So a lot of these things are, like, going to try and cause your veins to con or arteries to constrict. And the variant is just like, okay, they're trying to, like, not have that. So it's just kind of um, variant or random. And then for some reason, they also said that it tends to happen between midnight and 8 a.m. So, like, when you're at rest, it just happens. I don't know. Okay. But that is a very unique thing to this one that you won't see in the other ones. So if they mention anything about midnight to 8 a.m. or happening at rest and having to do with being cold or vasospasming, you know, it's the variant slash Prince Metals angina. So she says the difference between microvascular and variant is the, the fact that it happens during cold weather and such, and then that it's usually in the middle of the night. Midnight yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then treating this one again, figure out what the cause is. So, um, if it's smoking, stop. If it's stress, maybe take a yoga class or something. Um, but you also might put this person on calcium channel blockers to help regulate some of that and some nitro during episodes. Just pop a nitro. So. I feel like we kind of went all over the place, but did we finally make sense of it all or did yeah. we get lost? Yeah, there were no we ended up in MI, but there was a reason. There was what? There was a reason we ended up looking at all the MI stuff. Well, because this a lot of this stuff can lead to an MI. Oh, okay. Like an unstable angina can lead to an MI if you don't fix it or you don't like calm down, you know. You know, like, this, you see the videos of, like, the, the guy running, and he starts having chest pain. He's like, oh, I'm fine, and he keeps going, and then he falls over and has a heart attack. You know, so, like, at the first sign of chest pain is that you should stop, rest, you know, let your heart calm down, like, pop a nitro, and maybe don't have a heart attack. You know what I mean? Maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, shall I race this? I mean, unless you want to keep your MI stuff because we're going into that. Well, we'll, yeah, we'll just do it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see what time is it? Probably have to finish with MI. Okay, so MI is still part of ACS, acute coronary syndrome. It's just basically like exacerbated angina, like untreated and worsened angina. Because angina is really just insufficient oxygenation to meet the demand and then mi is the same thing but now you've caused damage right does that make sense mm -hmm. okay so two times of two types of mi what are they uh acute wait <laughs> two types I don't see two types. I don't know. STEMI and non-STEMI. That's it. Okay. Yeah, that's on the next page. So what is STEMI? Um, what does that mean? I don't remember. Hold on. That was, oh, ST elevation MI. Exactly. So non-ST -elevation. elevation myocardial infarction and a non-ST elevation. So yeah, they're basically saying you can have an MI, an, a heart attack where you have ST elevation or you can have a heart attack where you don't have ST elevation, right? So they'll tell you that a, a STEMI or one that has the ST, that's a full occlusion. Can you see that in the video? Yeah. So this would be an ST, right? This is the baseline. And this would be the ST elevation. They'll say that's a, a full, occlu full occlusion. So like a clot that's um, blocking off the entire vessel. Right, it leads to the part of the muscle. So like a whole, a whole, a whole clot right there. Yeah. Now they'll tell you that non-STEMI is partial, right? And so you won't see that ST elevation because you've still got like some blood flow getting through. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing with non-STEMI is that for whatever reason, women tend to present that way. So even if they do, like, are having, like, a full-on heart attack, women, for some reason, may not have 
It just it's just much more common for women to have a non stemmy. And really, when you look at like the just the root of what's going on here is that you just have a mismatch of supply and demand of oxygen, and that can be caused from a clot. And that can be caused from all sorts of different things, but typically a clot, especially if it's kind of like sudden, like that. Um, now, let's talk about some risk factors for heart attack. I mean, we know most of them just off the top of our heads. So what are some risk factors for, for that? Who's the most likely to have a heart attack? Uh, age. Age, obesity. Yeah. Hypertension, right? Type two diabetes. <laughs> Type two diabetes is a risk factor <laughs> for everything. Yeah. Literally, <laughs> all. If you see that on NCLEX, circle it. Um, age, obesity. Miss um, Hunt said. It was, is it? It's always. always it's always diabetes. diabetes. <laughs> yeah, I promise you. Um, people that don't do a lot of exercise, so sedentary, so yeah, sedentary, sedentary lifestyle. Um, smoking, obviously. High cholesterol. Yeah, and we talk about why cholesterol is part of that because it yeah. blocked. It's essentially forming a clot, right? So like, this could be plaque buildup instead of a clot, right? And you're still having a partial occlusion. Okay. She said. Uh... Sorry. Um. Postmenopause. Stemi. She she mentioned stemi, and then she said. Complete occlusion of a coronary vessel by plaque rupture. Yeah, so the plaque can dislodge. Like usually, it's like stuck onto the onto the lining. And it leads but to the heart vessels and yeah, sometimes the pl the the plaque can just like come off and just start floating down the bloodstream until it gets somewhere narrow and just gets wedged and locked in there. So that's okay. also bad. And it would cause an MRI to go into the heart. Yeah. Yep, sure could. Um, so see, there's some, these are some risk factors, most of them that we know anyways. Signs and symptoms. So how do you know if someone's having a heart attack? Chest pain. Yeah, they say it feels like an elephant is sitting on your chest. It's yeah, like a heavy weight, heavy pressure, like your heart's gonna explode. Uh, you're gonna have those enzymes, those cardiac enzymes on, a, on the blood tests. Um, nausea, vomiting. Uh, you know that that pain the, the pain in your arm pain in your jaw women tend to have like different um signs and symptoms than men do so they don't typically have like the the stereotypical ones they'll tend to have things that are kind of vague like back pain like okay no one thinks back pain is related to a heart attack but they tend to have more silent heart attacks if that makes sense women yeah women do yeah um um, yeah, what else? Um, cause we're just, we, we suffer in silence. Yeah, we just, <laughs> we just, we just don't complain about our pain. Though. So <laughs> troponins, troponins will tell you that you're having specific, um, heart muscle injury. There's another one, shoot. There's another marker that'll tell you about. CKMB? I think that might be it. Cardiac, it's a cardiac specific enzyme. She said they used to use it more, no they don't. Yeah, troponins are pretty much always used. Yeah, there's another one. I don't remember what it was, but like it'll talk about like any muscle injury. So it's not really necessarily great because like you could have, I don't know, injured your leg muscle and it'll come back high, but oh. it's nothing to do with your heart. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, okay, so treating this, how do we treat a heart attack? Mm, treat, it's right here. Well, first we're going to monitor them. So what are we going to strap on them? 12 lead. Yeah. 12 lead EKG. So we can see what's going on. What are we trying to hopefully not see? ST elevation. <laughs> right. So I can draw those again if you want me to. The so if they have n semi, are you just not able to identify it or you have to go off of symptoms? Or are there yeah, other... I mean, there's other things like the markers and all sorts of other stuff. You right. know, that's just... The ST elevation um, tells you that you have muscle injury, and that also corresponds with the troponins, right? Because those both have to do with muscle injury, right? 
So you could have troponins and maybe not ST elevation. Um, ST depression, that was for unstable angina, right? And you have the T wave inversion, that was also for unstable angina. And that one means what? What did the T wave inversion mean? Um, uh, ischemia. Yeah. So the ischemia just means that you have reduced oxygen, right? Mm -hmm. So it's like I'm holding my breath, right? Necrosis is where you have so much of a decrease in oxygen that it kills it. Dead tissue. Yeah. So T, and that would be the Q wave, right? The Q wave formation is the necrosis, and that will always be there forever. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It's like a dead spot or a scar on the heart that just doesn't do anything. So if you can remember these four types, that'll help you a lot, I think. Um, what else? 12 lead monitor, troponins, giving them oxygen, right? Obviously, because the whole point is that they're having an oxygen shortage. Nitro to open up those vessels. Nitro is especially helpful if they have what? Uh, like a partial occlusion. Or an right, because it helps widen right. the vessel even more yeah. to make room for more blood to go through. Um, morphine, you give morphine. And, okay, so this brings us to the, uh, I think that in your notes they call it a PCI, a percutaneous, Yeah. what is it? Percutaneous intervention? I wrote down what it was. I forget what the I stands for. Where are you? Um, it's the stent situation. I have to put a stent in. Risk factors, so it would be treatment. Yeah, treatment. See, I didn't get that far, but I remember seeing it somewhere. Well, whatever it anyway, is. Anyway, it's yeah. basically another name for it is an angioplasty. Okay. Um, it's where they I'm trying to see if there's room on the video. So, like, let's say this is your vessel here, and a stent. They'll put like a catheter in you and then put like this wire mesh that's like <coughs> a really firm material. Percutaneous coronary intervention. I was right, okay, it is intervention. Sweet, yeah. so I don't know if you can tell like this. Okay. This is like a mesh that they'll insert into your, um, into your vessel. Mm -hmm. That'll, it's stronger to keep it open, to keep it from caving in, from getting blocked off. Um, sometimes they'll have to like, chisel through some like plaque buildup to get a stent in there to open it up to keep it from constricting so that you can always have better blood flow. So you have blood flow through the stent. Does that make sense? Yeah. So that's what a PCI is, percutaneous intervention. It's also called angioplasty. So if you hear any of those, I'm more familiar with angioplasty than, than PCI. Um, are they also called a stent? So if you hear any of those three, um, now you can get this within how, within how long? You come into the hospital, someone's having MI due to a clot. How, how many minutes are they allowed to have been there with those symptoms if they can have a angioplasty? I don't know. 90 minutes. Okay. So they want you to have it done. They want you to have, as soon as you enter the door of the hospital with the, the chest pain, Still they diagnose crying. you with having a STEMI, then you got 90 minutes to get in there. Okay. Right? Um, they can also give you, depending, um, a fibrinolytic, which will which will bust up the clots. So if you do have a clot, right, and this is what you have right here, they can give you a fibrinolytic. Fibrinolytic. To break down the clot. Yeah, it, lytic means to break down, and fibrin is like the fibrous. Or, yeah. And so, what what are we what drug do we have that we know of that is one of these? Alteplase. <laughs> Alteplase is the name of the fibrinolytic that will break down that clot. 
So you can do those, you can do proper analytics, you can do stents within 90 minutes. When would you not want to use a fiber analytic? Um, if they're bleeding? Yes. Okay. So if there's a bleeding risk, um, like maybe they're at risk for having a hemorrhage or they're having a, you know, they, you don't have like different kinds of strokes. You can have hemorrhagic stroke or like the occlusive, the, the clot types of stroke. Mm -hmm. You don't want to use a fiber analytic if they're having a hemorrhagic stroke because that's going to make them bleed more, right? So that's why you always have to like diagnose first what's causing it before you give that. Okay. Um, yes. And this, another option, um, instead of a stent, is something called a cabbage. Is that, is that part of your notes too? Yeah, it was a coronary artery bypass graft. Yeah, coronary, coronary artery bypass graft. So this is for people that have like really bad vessels. So let me see if I can figure out how to draw this. Um, I don't know if I can, <laughs> but basically you have your, let me just, so you have your heart and you have a bunch of different arteries and vessels in your heart, right? So sometimes you'll get a stent and you'll be like, okay, cool. But then you have to come back and you, they find out, oh man, you have five blocked vessels. We could do like six stents or we can do a cabbage, right? A cabbage is where they take a piece of another vein. Like usually the head from your notes was the saphenous vein or the internal mammary artery. They'll take like a piece of it and use it to bypass those blocked vessels. So like they'll take a piece of it, cut it out. And then like, let's say like this is your, your vessel that's clogged. I don't know how to... If this is your vessel that's clogged here, rather than like putting a stent in, like maybe they'll take, you know, a graft from somewhere else to bypass it. So they'll insert a vessel here and attach it like that so that the blood doesn't have to go this way. It can just go through the bypass. So is she, is she, uh, ugh, I'm out of it. Can I draw, <laughs> like, yeah. trying to ask a question. I don't know how to ask it. Sure, you're gonna have green veins. So let's say green veins. <laughs> I have red and blue. It's all right. Just like, here's, here's the, here's a blood vessel and there's all these branches coming off and there's, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six occlusions. So they're grafting from here to, you know, here, like this one's fine past here. Like there's, the vessels are continuing yeah, on. So they they're just, all occluded, so they graft to like this one basically. Yep, they can do up to six vessels and I'm sure it just depends on the anatomy. Is that what they're doing? Yeah, so they would just attach. They're just bypassing all of these occlusions. Yeah, let's say this one's blocked here, this one's blocked, That's blocked, 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 yeah, blocked. Yeah. So they'll just, like, you know, we're just going to take a, a detour. Okay. And so rather than trying to fix all of these ones, they'll just put in a new, okay. a new road, if that makes sense. Got it. You know, like when there's like a, tr a new traffic pattern and they're like working on the roads, they'll like sometimes make a road that you can go around. It's kind of like, kind of like that. Yeah. Your drawing's just as great as mine, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> um, Why not? Yeah. So that's what a cabbage is. Um, what else about cabbages? You can do up to six, f up to five or six vessels using, like I said, the saphenous vein or the internal mammary artery. <laughs> um, there are obviously are risks with this, just like there's risks with everything. Um, I'm trying to think if there's anything specifically else about this. Um, we talked about tamponade already. Uh, that can be a potential complication from a cabbage as well as pericarditis. Um, they might have a chest tube post-surgery. That's what I noticed. I did the cardiac step-down unit and they all always had chest tubes. Yeah. So what do we want to, what do we want to make sure of if they have chest tubes? What do we monitor? Make sure that the thing is on, what, what is that thing called? On, is on the ground below the chest. So you want to make sure that it, the, the tube is patent and it's flowing, right? Yeah. Let, let's say like they're having constant drainage, like, you know, you're measuring and it's pretty consistent every hour and then all of a sudden it just stops. Like it doesn't start tamper, it doesn't start trickling off, it just stops. You think, hmm, maybe the tube maybe is occluded. Cool. 
right? It could be occluded, it could be clotted off, which would be bad because it can't drain, right? So you wanna monitor that. Um, you know, it'd be normal for it to start trickling down, like maybe it goes from 20 mLs to 10 to five, but it shouldn't go from like 50 to zero, right? All of a sudden, because that's like, hmm, something's blocking it or it got displaced or something like that. So monitoring that, um, yeah. I mean, that's, that's the basic quick and dirty of MI. Do you wanna do some questions or I just quiz you on some things for the last couple minutes? Yes, but don't count it as a reflection of your teaching. <laughs> <laughs> do you want me to, I'm, I'm, you know. Do you want me to quiz on the stuff we just did or stuff from this lecture and last lecture? Or none of the above? Yeah. <laughs> do you want me to erase this or leave it up? Do you like my answer? Yes. I'm gonna leave this up so you can cheat and look at it. Whatever you want to do. I don't or actually, I might write stuff down. I'm, I'm gonna erase this. Right now. Huh? I'm not good at making decisions right now. I'm not gonna make decisions. <laughs> well, fortunately, this is being recorded so you can watch it later if you just really miss me and wanna hear my voice. That's gonna be part of my series. Really Listen to my voice as you fall asleep at night. <laughs> <laughs> That's not crazy at all. All That's right. It's Wednesday. Is it Wednesday? Is what Wednesday? Today. Today's Tuesday. Tuesday. Why are we? Hmm? Okay. It's Tuesday. All right. It's just my kids with their adventures. It's on Wednesday and someone was saying we're not, we're not going to have it. I was like, wait, is it Wednesday? Okay, so I'm going to do stuff from not just today, but also from before. Okay. Um, I'm going to cheat. Hmm? Nothing. You're, this is open note. <laughs> Open note. What did we do the first time? We did dysrhythmia, CHF, hemodynamics. Oh, we did everything. Um, and some shock. Okay. So we kind of went over all the. Okay, so let's have a quiz. Um. All right. Someone comes in, you look at their EKG, and this is what you see on their EKG. What is it, and how do you treat it? VTAC. VTAC, correct. What kind of treatments do you want to give this person? Do we do um, defibrillation? It, you can do defibrillation if what? If there's no pulse, or no, no, there has to be a pulse. No pulse, no breathing. Okay. This is what allows you to do what? Defibrillation. Okay. Right? But it has to be synchronized. So that's with a pulse. Cardioversion, the synchronized cardioversion is if they are conscious and do have a pulse. Basically, pulseless VTAC. I see it. Yeah. Basically, if someone comes in and they don't have a heart, I mean, they have a heart. They don't have heartbeat and they're not breathing. We call them dead, right? So that's when you defibrillate. But they have this going on, right? Okay. Now, rhythmless, rhythmless. If they have, if their heart rhythm is a systole and they're not breathing don't do and don't have a pulse, you can't defibrillate because okay. there's there's no electrical activity. To defibrillate. The point okay. of defibrillation is to interrupt the electrical activity that has messed up their heart muscle, right? This is showing that there is no electrical activity if, if there's a asystole. So there's nothing to interrupt. So we right? check, check for pulse. If there's no pulse, we start CPR immediately, ask for help. CPR for sure. If and they are the awake control. and they do have a pulse, but they still have VTAC, then that's when you would want to do the synchronized cardio version. Okay. Right? So that way you make sure you time it just right so that you get it right where it's supposed to be. Make sense? Yep. Also, Medications wise, what are you going to give them? There was a, there was a medication. There's two that I'm thinking of that you can give for VTAC. Any life threatening rhythm, what were you going to think about giving? Starts with an E. Oh, epinephrine. Epinephrine. Anytime there's a life threatening rhythm, whether that be VTAC, VFib, uh, what else? You can also give it with asystole and you can give it with pulseless electrical act activity. So anything that's like, they're pretty much dead or dying immediately, epinephrine's your best friend. Okay. Also amiodarone. Amiodarone, amiodarone is great a. for arrhythmias. Okay. Oh, it's on the last chapter, that's fine. All right. Okay. 
I'm gonna erase this one. Okay. Goodbye, VTAC. <laughs> Let's see. All right, this is gonna be a bit of a tricky one. Maybe. Okay. Oh man, it's the heart block. <laughs> <laughs> okay, third degree. Okay, first, before you jump to anything, okay. <laughs> first of all, we notice that's a heart block, so that's good. So heart block, perfect. Now, how do we differentiate between the heart blocks? We have to look at the what? The Q T the. P P R, R integrals. integrals. <laughs> right. So with the heart block type one, the it just prolonged. It's just prolonged. So the PR interval is the same, but it's just each one is just there's a, a there's a big diff there's a wow I can't speak there's a delay between the P and the QRS right. So this would just be like you have this over and over again, like this right here, right? That'd be first degree. Second degree is what? So there's type one winky back. Type Bottom. two is winky back. Wait, what did I say? I mean like the first. Oh, not, not most, sorry. First type two. There's only uh, first degree and then there's two types of second. No. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. Gosh, between both of us, we're doing real good today. <laughs> first degree, second degree. So this is not so first degree. We can, we can cross no, that No, 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 this yes. is not first degree. But the first type of second degree. The first type of second degree. Right, so in the second type degree, one, second degree. Right, there's yeah. two types of second degree. So type one was where it got longer and longer and longer, skipped, and then went back to normal. Move it's one, move it's two. Yes. I'm just gonna write this down so we don't confuse ourselves. Okay. Now, which one of these is called the winky back? Move it's one. All right, so this is winky back. All right, so do you remember my little story about winky? Yeah, winky I'm stayed gonna... away longer and longer and longer, and then he didn't come home. I'm gonna tell the story for the and sake of went this back video. to normal. So Mrs. P is married to the QRS and we'll call him Winky. So this is Mrs. P here. And this is Winky. Now, they have a strained relationship. They've grown some distance between them, right? They used to be closer and now they've got distance. And so now Winky has started, you know, coming home later and later. So he came home late here because there's a space here. The next night he comes home even later and then the night after that he doesn't even come home winky is missing right there there should be a qrs right right there mm -hmm. not there but then the next night winky back right so late 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 gone back so that's why that one's winky back w that's what the w is does that make sense okay so that one what was the first thing you said was Third degree, right? Right, because it looked like there was no association. It looks like what? <laughs> it doesn't look like there's no association between yeah. the two. Third degree is where it's just, there's yeah. No and it's hard to tell with my drawing because you can't see any lines. You know? I see what you're saying, though. I see yeah. I see you're more prolonged. I see what you're Yeah, I was yeah. trying to get bigger, bigger. I was long. seeing yeah. no association, but yeah. I do see it now. Third degree is it's just completely random, and yeah. you can't even measure the PR interval because it's just constantly different. At least this one follows a pattern. So like, if you were to see a longer strip of this, it would follow the same pattern. So maybe it's like two blocks, four blocks, six blocks, two blocks, four blocks, six blocks. So it's gonna repeat itself. Whereas third degree, it's like, there is no consistency whatsoever. It's electrical divorce. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I'm erasing this. Okay, but then the second degree, no progressive lengthening. It's right. just constant and there's just some yeah. random thing Mobitz there. two or second degree Mobitz two is that the PR interval is always the same because Mrs. P is always loyal and consistent and the QRS will either be there sometimes or it won't. Okay. So Winky's just like there sometimes when it feels like it and not there other times. And that one was slightly more dangerous or whatever. Is that right? Um, that one does need a pacemaker, yes. That, yeah, you can't treat it with that. Yes, you need a pacemaker. Alright, same. Let's move on from those. 
Um. I don't even know what to ask. It'll come to you. Um, let's see. Okay, I'm gonna give you a list of symptoms. You're gonna tell me what they got. All right. Tell me what this patient has, okay? Okay, we'll just, we'll think it through. Okay, so this is a patient. Um, jugular vein distension, pulmonary edema, S3 murmur, reduced cardiac output, swollen ankles, hypertrophy. I just kind of made this up as a patient looking at different things. So it's not like this is a textbook, but this is just like symptoms that you would see with this disorder. Okay. So what are you thinking? Let me know what, what you're thinking. Some sort of itis. Well, what does S3 tell you? What kind of, what does, what causes this type of murmur? Um, um, pericarditis? I'm not, I'm not talking about itises, I'm just talking about what <clears throat> condition causes an S3 murmur. This is the, the ventri left ventricle uh, insufficiency or um, fluid buildup. Fluid buildup. Ventricle. Right, so fluid buildup causes the S3, okay? So that's one clue. Now, reduced cardiac output. That'd be a result of that. Yes. Um, <clears throat> what does swollen ankles and pulmonary edema tell you? That the heart is not working effectively. Right. It's, yeah. And this yeah. is also related so to fluid buildup. The swollen right. ankles also could be indicative of right sided heart failure. It could, yes. So, putting it all together, what kind of heart problem is this probably? Let's say you also have an increased blood pressure. So that would be also increased SVR as a compensatory mechanism. I want to say... We talked about this Just last heart week. failure in general. Yep, heart failure, but specifically... Left-sided heart failure, or what, what, what What's the fluid part? Uh, congestive heart failure. Congestive heart failure, right? Okay. So all these things are caused by fluid. So okay. the congestive part is like the fluid is the reason that's causing all of the heart failure. Okay. Right? You have the build up of fluid. It's not pumping out right. And all of the fluid starts to back up. Back up into the lungs. You get pulmonary edema. Backs up to the systemically. You get the swollen ankles. Your heart compensates. You're trying to, you know, the heart muscle starts building around the ventricle. You got the hypertrophy. Your blood pressure skyrockets to try and overcome that systemic vascular resistance to pump it out. It's not working. Um, so these are the kind of signs some you'd be looking for. Yeah? Okay. What kind of drugs do we give these people? Um, we usually start with diuretics. Perfect, because fluid's the problem. Yeah. So Lasix all day. Yeah. <laughs> Lasix for life. Maybe, Everyone gets yeah. Lasix. Everyone gets a Lasix. <laughs> uh, yeah. What's the other one that starts with it? Uh, mannitol or whatever? Um, the stronger one. Beta blockers are helpful. Yeah. That because it's hypertensive. And again, I'm, the reason why beta blockers are helpful. Well, we're resting the heart. So the heart is overworking and we need to just give it a break. Yes. Because it's beta blockers are technically beta adrenergic blockers. And the adrenergic part has to do with adrenaline. And adrenaline is like the fight or flight, like increases your blood pressure, increases your heart rate. And it's like, right. that's the opposite of what we need right now. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So it'll block adrenaline. So it will reduce your heart rate, reduce your blood pressure, give your heart a break. You also want to give ACE inhibitors. ACE inhibitors, why? Do you remember the ROS? The yeah, so it, it works on the... Um, Let me erase this. Yeah, it works on the ROS system. I'm going to... What was it? The, draw it real quick. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to think through the... Picture. Starts with the kidneys. Yeah. So the kidneys produce what? It was at the lungs. What do the kidneys produce? Uh, ADH. Renin. 
Brennan. And then, then you get angiotensin one. Where does the, huh? Nothing, I was thinking alone. The angiotensin one goes to where in the body? Does it not go to the lungs? This it goes to, go to the lungs, lungs right? Okay. So in the lungs, you have an enzyme called what? ACE. ACE, which is easy to remember because it's angiotensin the angiotensin-converting enzyme. Converting enzyme. Yeah. And this turns into angiotensin 2, yeah. which is a potent what? Uh, diur or antidiuretic. Or Vaso vasoconstrictor. That's what it is. So this is going to cause your blood pressure to skyrocket. So if you have ACE inhibitors, if you have a pill, that's, that's a pill. An ACE inhibitor is going to block ACE from doing its job, which means that enzyme is no longer going to work, which means angiotensin 1 cannot convert into angiotensin 2, which means you will not have vasoconstriction. You will have vasodilation. And that also helps push, give the heart a break. So beta blockers and ACE inhibitors are what you want to give for congestive heart failure. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Once you kind of understand what's happening in the heart, like patho-wise, like path pathophysiology, like the signs and symptoms make sense and then treating what the issues are makes sense. I think you were pretty strong with this when we went over it last time. I think it was just all the new material is like bogging the brain down a little bit. <laughs> so. It's been a long couple. I bet. How are you feeling about all this stuff? Pretty good? I think I need to study more. Well, yeah. But this is helpful, definitely. I think we'll go ahead and stop there. The brain is at a point of no longer absorbing. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that happened a little bit ago. <laughs> you could have said something. It's okay. I started to like get kind of like, what are we talking about? Yeah. Is it Wednesday? I don't know. Well, I started calling Mobitz too. First degree, it's fine. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna stop this. Goodbye.